are now going to move on to another panel discussion, and this is Worldwide Sustainability Challenges. Moderating this panel is Rory Moore, who is the advisor to the UK government on volunteering, national volunteering strategy and youth representative to the United Nations. I'd also like to mention that he was recently nominated for a Forbes, under, for the, sorry, Forbes 30 under 30 list. Thank you, Amy. And uh, I'd just like to say what a pleasure it is to be here uh, in front of all these distinguished guests. Uh, thank you to His Highness and His Excellency for the invitation to be here. And the topic for today is worldwide sustainability challenges. And as I was flying over here, I was thinking about what I wanted to get out of the discussion because as an audience from a range of different companies, a range of different organizations, you all know that sustainability is a challenge and you don't need us as a panel to tell you that there are many issues that your companies face. So we're not going to tell you that sustainability is a problem, that these are the issues. Rather, what I want to do and what I want to get out of this session is give you a range of ideas, and actions that you can implement and solutions to these problems that we can discuss. So I think this is a great time to have this discussion uh, because we're coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic and this has been a fundamental shift in the way the world works. We're never going to be the same as we were before. We've had a fundamental economic crisis, a political one, but also the most profound social challenge in modern history with isolation and children not being able to go to school. So the world we create after the pandemic is going to be different and we have a unique opportunity to create that world now. So this is what we're going to be discussing today, what we can do to make the world a better place. And we've got a fantastic range of panelists to talk us through this. So first, I'd like to welcome to the stage Iftika Hamdani, who is the Area General Manager for the Coral Beach Resort and Bay Ajman Palace Hotel. Iftika. Thanks. Uh, next, we have Nicholas Watson, who is the CEO and co-founder of U-Drive UAE. Uh, next, we have Dr. Hanen Benaluk, who is the founder of Tawazan and the executive director of Sustain Leadership Consulting. Then we have Paul Lalovic, who is the managing partner of Agile Dynamics and the CEO and founder of Synthetic Equity. And last, but by no means least, we have Mariam Al. Mansouri, who is the general manager for Rebound Exchange. So, thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm sorry I'm a bit far away from you, but I want to start with a general question and talk, because we're talking about sustainability challenges, but the way in which people conceptualize sustainability may vary from person to person. So I thought it's best to start by talking a little bit more about what it means to have a sustainable economy. And Mariam, you have a very innovative model for recycling plastic. So maybe you'd be well placed to talk us through a bit about your work, but also what it means to have a sustainable economy and how we can achieve that. Great, so uh, first of all, thank you everyone for being here. It's a pleasure to be speaking with the distinguished uh, guests. In terms of sustainable economy, how we build it is really, sustainability is not a two month or five year implementation plan, it's rather a mind shift and a lifestyle. So through the Rebound Plastics Exchange, we are addressing the global problem of plastic pollution through sustainable actions that have economical returns. So whenever a model is built or a thinking is put through or a strategy is put together, people really and decision makers have to keep in mind how can this be sustained, how can it continue not only at the level that it's set to achieve but also achieve higher levels and at the end of the day what are the unique collaborative synergies and partnerships that can take place in a business model so everyone puts his uh, bit of the pie. Thank you. Thank you. And you talk about the model of partnerships for sustainability. Can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by that and how we can achieve uh, partnerships that are effective and deliver impact rather than just being, you know, some sort of a photo opportunity? How can we actually deliver strategic partnerships that have a benefit? So if we go back to the way that the UAE was built, it was built on the principle of unity. And it's very important for business leaders, whether they're multinationals or whether they're family businesses and even startups to recognize that there are already 
um, existing businesses that are specialized at what they do. So for instance, at Rebound Plastics Exchange, we realize that we need to work with lawyers, we need to work with specification standards and metrics, we need to work with the logistics companies, we need to work with insurance companies. And so give, again, selecting your strategic partners in a way that the entire ecosystem and multi-stakeholder engagement map is fulfilled, not necessarily by reinventing the wheel yourself as a company, but by engaging with the right partners at stake. Thank you. That's, I think that's a really powerful message, and I think lots of people can take away from that how important it is to form these strategic partnerships. But also, I've noticed at this summit, obviously, we have a range of different themes we're covering. We're talking a lot about innovation. We're talking a lot about sustainability. But of course, we can bring those two together uh, to facilitate uh, better change. And Iftika is doing some really great work in, in the hospitality sector. And Iftika, maybe you'd like to talk a little bit more about how you're using technology to create more sustainable business in hospitality. Uh, thank you, Rory. Um, you know that in 2011, I mean prior to 2011, green was just a color for me and uh, you know I adopted sustainability as my religion from 2011 and you cannot imagine that since I adopted um, a real sustainability in my personality, it was great uh, benefit, commercial benefit for uh, my property, for the owners. Um, I built a team where we had a 65% turnover staff came into 2%. We had one hotel uh, in 10 years, we had three hotels. So practically in my life, I really enjoyed being a sustainable um, uh, a hospitality person, you know. And uh, you know that I adopted actually uh, initially without technology because you know that first of all, it's very important to, to, to make your mindset, you know. You need to accept it by yourself. And being a leader of the hotel where I had 170 staff, I have to transform this to, to them also. So we were doing uh, manually so many uh, actions, but I realized that without technology, I think that we cannot go further. So what I did that I had started, you know, the areas which we are really uh, lacking in, in hospitality. And waste management was really a big task because we incur a lot of waste from the hotel, you know. So I started working on a, on a, on a waste management. I brought the first compost machine in the Middle East we develop an urban farm. The used cooking oil from the, uh, from the kitchen, you know, was just a waste. We converted this used cooking oil into biodiesel. So these kind of, you know, steps uh, were very easy to adopt, actually, because, you know, that we are doing everyday operation in the hotel. And just to change our mind and use technology was really a big benefit. Can you imagine that 90% of the waste from the hotel was diverted from the landfill? Ajman is a very small emirate. We have a total contribution of 600 ton every day. My hotel was contributing one ton waste every day. And by taking this compost machine, we were able to divert 90% you know, waste. And not only this, that we diverted waste and we were responsible. Commercially, it was so viable that the ROI was just like in a one year time. You know. So we paid all that machine amount in one year. And last 10 years, we are getting benefit because 120,000 dirham we are saving every year. So as a matter of fact, in all businesses, it's a hospitality. If every day we think that how we are really incurring wrong things, wrong practices as an individual, as a corporate company, as a government, I think all together we can make a big difference, Rory. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And uh, I particularly like how you spoke about the transformation and how you've been on an impact journey as well. You know, it wasn't easy at the start, but you made those changes and you've seen the results from that. I think that's something that everyone should take away because it's not easy to make that first decision, but it delivers in, in the long term. So I think that's a really important message. But of course, not everyone is like Iftikar and implementing these uh, sustainable solutions from the start. And sometimes people require incentivization. And I think Paul is a great person to bring in here because he helps organizations grow with his consulting firm. And so, Paul, I want to ask you, why, why should businesses think about ESG? But more importantly, what can we do to make them uh, incentivize them to take these concrete actions to improve society? What do you think about that? Thanks, Rory. So when it comes to, to getting things done at the end of the day, it's all about incentivizing uh, the right behaviors and making sure that people do the right thing when nobody's watching. And this is notoriously difficult because it requires deep thinking and most importantly, it requires a very clear message that's going to resonate with people 
all the way to the deepest level of the organization or society. And you need to answer that question, what's in it for me? Why should I do what I'm expected to do? And this ultimately creates a very, very different landscape that the future is going to paint for all of us because it's shifting the, the perspective from the shareholder to a stakeholder. And this is exactly what is presenting us with a massive opportunity to create this mindset shift. So we need to start looking at a broader picture, so outside of the, of the, of the capital owners, and uh, look into the stakeholder ecosystem that includes the suppliers, the employees, their families, their communities, and goes beyond that. And this value proposition needs to resonate with them. And this is exactly where the technology today presents the opportunity. Now, more than ever, we have tools and solutions at our disposal to make this work, to break down the complexity that comes with this uh, endeavor and ultimately to make this equitable uh, incentivization a reality. And this is exactly where the artificial intelligence, uh, blockchain, and most importantly, all the innovation coming around DAO, the distributed uh, autonomous organization is kicking in today. And again, you know, it's a pretty you know, long story around it, but what it comes down to, it really connects the expected outcomes, behaviors, and incentives. Without it, we're going to spend a lot of time, effort, and energy, and we might not really get where we're planning to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I would completely agree with that. And I, I think we've spoken a lot there about how we can innovate and bring in new ideas to help tackle some of these solutions. But what we're finding increasingly is that there's not just new ideas out there, but there are many ideas which we are, as a society or as companies are not listening to. And there's many voices that we're not empowering. And those ideas don't always need to be found as new ones, but actually they're just not being listened to in the first place. So it's a great time to bring in Hanane because she has a think tank. Uh, she founded a think tank to tackle gender inequality. And so Hanane, my question to you is how can we uh, leverage the opinions and why is, it important to, why is it important to build these diverse teams and get these different perspectives when we're constructing companies and progressing forward? Thank you, Rory. First of all, it's an honor to be sharing the stage with uh, these movers and shakers and change makers. Since yesterday, I feel that uh, I learned so much and I can graduate with another degree just from the amazing information that was shared on this platform. Um, so, just before I answer your question, as I was listening to everyone and from yesterday, I remembered there was a piece of information that I found about um, what sustainability really means. Because at the end of the day, it remains still this buzzword, this sophisticated world that all of us are trying to tackle. But I wanted to bring it really to life. And I found this, this fact that said that if we want our descendants based on that in 2050, we will become a population of 9 billion. And if we wanted our descendants to live the same lifestyle, and who wouldn't want to have the same lifestyle that we are blessed with today, we, need, we will need 3.5 Earth. So I just want each of us to let that sink in. 3.5, the amount of Earth that we have today. And so that means it's really an imperative that we start thinking about sustainability in a broader way, that we start thinking how can we each um, you know, make our bit to, to make it happen, starting by bridging a lot of gaps. And that's what we try to do at Tawazun. And Tawazun just means balance in Arabic because we can't strive for equality yet. Last time I checked, we needed 150 years to uh, reach equality if we want to talk about gender. And I don't think anyone in this room will be there to celebrate equality. So instead of striving for that, let's start by bridging the gaps. Let's start by starting and looking at it. How do we include everyone so that we can work together rather than working against each other? And that's why Tawazun was launched. Actually, initially, it was about just uh, tackling the gender issue, but then after COVID and what I saw and everybody was talking about all these imbalances in life, I felt there are a lot more important issues than just gender. So let's work together to bridge these gaps 
and to reduce those imbalances. Um, and balanced world, at the end of the day, which we all aspire for, is anchored by four main pillars. And that was what the population we surveyed told us through our action. When we asked everyone, even kids, we just asked them, what does balance mean to you? And I want everyone to think about that. Eight-year-old kid, 12-year-old, we have a founding member, and I'm going to quote him, Hamdan Zaabi. He's 12 years old. He's one of our founding members at Tawazun because we wanted to create that space to listen to everyone's perspective. We have made so much harm to keep imposing our points on how we can grow this uh, sustainable world. Now we need to listen from top to, uh, from down, bottom to up, and listen and give a space and safe space to everyone to tell us what did they think about how we can build a balanced world. And for us, it's really about engaging. It's really about starting by balanced people. You cannot strive to talk about environmental and space when you still have people that are still at the bottom of their mass low pyramid. So we start with the well-being of people. We work to workplaces to develop balanced leaders that can create that balance between profit and purpose. We go to the society and make sure that everybody's included, people with special needs, minorities, ethnic minorities and then together we can move and start working on the balanced planet so for us this is what matters how do we raise that awareness how do we each of us make our bit and how do we start looking at it in a human centric way rather than a gender centric way and that's what we try to achieve at Tawaz. thank you thank you and I think that point you made that, that point you made around youth engagement is, is a crucial one because, of course, young people, we're going to be the leaders of tomorrow and we're going to be living in the planet that is affected by the decisions taken today. And I think I said it yesterday, but I'll say it again. I think the UAE is taking a lead on this and the fact that they're giving the platform to young people like myself to be here, it says a lot about the, the way the UAE views the role of young people and that's fantastic to see. So thank you again to His Excellency. But I just want to talk about diversity and inclusion a bit more because we've spoken about it from bringing in different voices, different perspectives, but also we can look at about it in terms of democratizing access. And that's why I want to bring in Nicholas because he founded the first car sharing platform in the Middle East. And this is in a way, and we were talking off stage, it empowers inclusion and it empowers access and diversity. So can you talk a little bit more about how it does that and how that's slightly different to the traditional way we conceptualize DNI? Yes, thank you very much. Um, so we're a car sharing company. You can rent the car on the street and drive it for one minute or one day, whatever you want. I think the key for sustainability is fractionalization. So obviously that sounds very crypto and blockchain. Of course, I love that concept. But the moment you fractionalize an asset, you give access to other people and you remove the burden for them to access it. So for example, we had uh, in March 480 cars. We have 600 at the moment, but in March we had 475 and we did 32,000 rentals car rentals in March. And our customer base is mid to low income. These are people that have 100 dirhams, but they don't have 1,000 dirhams to lock away on their credit card to rent a car. So we mobilize people that are effectively unmobilized. And in this region, you need a car to get anywhere. You need something that's enclosed. You need something that's cooling. Um, the other part is that for every car you put on the road that's car sharing, you actually remove cars from the streets. So while we have gas-guzzling vehicles, yes, we do have Mustangs and we do have Nissan Sunnies and stuff like this, the fact is those cars are moving more than if they were owned by a single individual. And because four or five people are using each car every day, you're, if you multiply that by them owning cars, that's even more wastage. So in the end, when people look at U-Drive, they see cars moving around, burning gas, but the reality is underneath, it's actually providing economic value to the country. It's given people mobility that don't normally have it. And our motto at U-Drive is mobility is a human right, the same as drinking and eating. So you fractionalize, you make it sustainable, you make it priced at the right amount, that the business is sustainable, and you give people access to it where you take the friction away from them, the risk. If you remove the risk, they will do it. If you keep the risk, like traditional rent car agencies with the deposits and damage checking and stuff like this, then you basically disincentivize people that really need mobility. And people ask us, why don't you put Ferraris? We're like, we could, we can digitize a Ferrari, it's not a problem. But they're not the people that need mobility. And they're not the ones that are gonna go out and just rent a car for an hour, right? So I think we, if you look at the, the economies of the world, especially the fast growing ones, your middle to low income are the fastest growing part of those economies. And then you have that in SMEs, 
You have it in uh, gender diversified populations, whether that's for females or students. So I think fractionalization and asset fractionalization and the digitization of that is the key to sustainability. And I think obviously from our point of view, it's on a car and other mobility forms. Thank you, Nick. I think that's a fantastic message for the, for the audience to take away and think about redefining the way in which we conceptualize the way we travel and the way we use these sorts of services. And I just want to, because we're running out of time, uh, get you all to prescribe a message or a piece of advice to the audience, because of course, we've talked about a lot of different topics in a small space of time, but if there's something that the audience can take away from this, either a thought or an action they can take, what would that be? Uh, maybe we could start with Iftika. Do you have any, anything you'd want the audience to take away from the session? Uh, very simple. I think that everybody would love it. Um, in my opinion, which I said on a many occasion, that creating a strong business and building a better world, these are not two conflicting goals. In my opinion, both are essential ingredients for a long-term uh, success, you know. So we need to adopt it. Thank you. Thank you, Iftika. Uh, and what about you, Mariam? Is there anything that you would want the audience to take away from the session today? So I got my takeaway inspired by my previous role working for the Cabinet of Ministers. And if there is one thing I'd like to tell business owners or policymakers is that regulation is innovation when inclusive. So including all multi-stakeholders on different levels, as previously also mentioned by um, Nicholas, including everyone, building a strong business uh, model and having governments regulate it or a, assure the quality and standards that its residents and citizens live by without restricting or limiting other players of the game in it as well. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. And maybe, Paul, Paul you could go next. Is there anything for the audience to derive from? Sure. So if you look at the three pillars of uh, sustainability, such as um, reusing, uh, reducing, and recycling, um, those are not going to become natural uh, occurrences unless you incentivize the right behaviors. I think, I think as, you, as you mentioned earlier, incentivization is crucial. We have some good actors, benevolent people like Iftika, but not everyone is empowered to make the world a better place, and sometimes they need that push, so that's a very good point to make. Uh, and then, Nicholas, is there anything you'd want the audience, uh, any wisdom you want to impart on the audience uh, as a last message? Yeah, I think... Um, just think about your business or what you do in life and the assets that you have. It doesn't have to be a car, it's just any type of asset. Stop thinking about when you're using it. Think about when you're not using it and what it's doing. Is it providing value to you, people around you, the economy you're in? Because if it's sitting there idle, it's wastage, absolute wastage. And that's, that's a, people flip your mindset. It's not when you're using, I'm enjoying it. It's what, am I do what is it doing when I'm not in it or I'm not using it? Yeah. Uh, flip it. And, and those numbers that you mentioned about uh, UAE Drive is incredible. So it's fantastic to see people are adopting that and it's making a difference. And then finally, uh, Hanane, I think you have a special message uh, to share. Yes, um, yes uh, I would say that um, we need to start thinking that maybe we need a systemic change. Maybe it's overwhelming all these uh, sustainable challenges that we have, which is the title of our panel. But every little change matters. We can start by planting a seed today that we might not see the outcome if the other generations might see it. And for me, it is important to plant the seeds of change. And that's the message that I have with my book, Seeds of Change, because we need leaders uh, that will plant the, leads of change, the seeds of change. And by the way, this is not just a, a name, it's a framework, and it's an acronym, because the leaders of the future need to sense engage, empower, continuously develop and sustain. And it will be my honor to give, to, co to give a copy to His Highness because for me, he is an example of a leader who is planting the seeds of change with platforms like the one we are here this two days so that together we can build a more equitable, balanced and sustainable world for us all. Thank you.
Well, thank you so much to all the panelists. It's been fantastic to hear about their experiences, and hopefully everyone has learned something today. And I'm sure if you have any questions, you can always ask them and catch them later. So thank you for your time, and thanks for listening. <laughs>